Hello, it's Heather. And Ferg. From New Old Friends. This is Comedy Who Done It's For Your Ears, episode three of Crimes of a Country Garden, our second series. Feels posh having a second series, doesn't it? Well, we are recording it in black tie. True. <laughs> Had to get out of those elasticated clothes at some point. Nice. Uh, okay, uh, so Lance Brown, the Longmeadow Gardener, is dead, and Penny Pink is determined she'll be the one to solve the case. As ever, thank you so much to anyone who has supported the company by buying us a virtual coffee at newoldfriends.co.uk. It's a real boost at these difficult times. Thank you, but don't forget, telling your friends, sharing on social media, and rating the podcast on iTunes is a really effective and totally free yeah. way of helping us out too. Enjoy episode three. Off we go. After Thomas, the Earl's valet, had shouted his announcement, Lance Brown is dead! Murdered! There was quite a stir, as you might expect. I was already out of my element at Longmeadow Hall, and the announcement of a murder was way beyond my comfort zone. But my training kicked in. And by my training, I mean hours of reading murder mystery paperbacks. I needed to get as clear a picture as possible of who was around at the time of the murder. I'd seen the gardener myself within the last hour or so, and I hadn't heard any engines, so whoever had done it was either still on the grounds or had legged it on foot. I needed to find Perry to increase the spread of my net. I took a hasty leave of Christoph and Lady Harriet. He'd barely reacted, but she was as white as a sheet, and I'd sprinted back to the house towards the library. Thomas's father, the butler, was patrolling the halls. No running in the house, if you please. There's been a murder, Mr Webster. Only of a gardener. Besides... Manners is manners. Murder or no, it's unladylike to run. I slowed my pace for the length of time it took me to get to the next doorway and then set off again. I found Perry huddle in the library with a great pile of books on either side of him. He will have started with one huge tower on his left and placed each book on his right when he was finished. I'd often find him like this in the early days of my employment and I was so impressed with the speed the books mounted on the right I asked him if he'd really read them all or just pretended. Test me, if you like. Oh, no, sir. I I didn't mean to suggest... No, I know you didn't, Miss Pink, but I quite enjoy it. Go on, pick any book at random from the red pile, open it on any page and ask me something. I grabbed one from near the middle of his stack and let it fall open about halfway through. It was a chapter on primal gods. OK, tell me about Coco Pelli? Absolutely. He's a trickster god in the Anasazi Indian mythology. He carries a large sack of tricks and treats and he plays the flute. How do you know he's a he? Right. Um, well, uh, if you look at the drawing on the next page, um, he's, uh, he's, he's depicted with a, uh, a very, very large, sort of disproportionately large, it's... Uh... Oh, my! I see. I've got no idea how Coco Pelli could possibly pull any pranks dragging that thing around with him. But that's not for now. Back to the library at Longmeadow Hall. Ah, Perry, there you are. Only in body, Penny girl. In my mind, I'm hurtling through the cosmos. I found this book about potential space travel by Dr. T. Grayson. It's incredible. Perry, have you heard all the commotion? What commotion? I opened the door. (laughs) That commotion, Perry. Blimey, what's going on? There's been a murder. Not another rosebush. No, Perry, an actual real-life murder. Real death murder? A real murder! Blimey, who was it? The gardener, Lance Brown. You've already solved it. He's the victim. Ah, that makes more sense. Right, so, um, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, I asked you first, Penny Girl. Come on, fair's fair. The PPDA is going to solve its very first murder, Perry. That's what we're going to do. Oh, Uh, are we? Feels like that might be a bit, you know, dangerous, Penny. Well, I'd never forgive myself if you got hurt on official P-Pink detective agency business. Well, then I promise not to get hurt, Perry, because there is no way I'm not investigating this, but I'm going to need your help. My help? Well, you're the detective. I'm just the assistant. Well, yes. Yes, of course. Right. So, um, here's the plan. We drop the pretense that I'm in charge and you tell me what you need me to do, Penny. Perry? Well, we don't have time. We both know it's true and this is far more important than some lost engagement ring. So let's just get on with it, shall we? We'll figure out the rest as we go. I could kiss you, Perry Pink. Blimey. Um... Metaphorically, I mean. Yes, yes, of course. Well, metaphorically, I'd kiss you right back. What? Nothing. The plan, Penny? Right, yes. 
I explained to Perry that we needed to split up. I'd search the perimeter and he was to check every room, making sure to note down everything he saw, no matter how innocuous it might seem. I'd forgotten how literal Perry's brain can sometimes be. He'd grabbed his notebook and started writing furiously. What are you writing, Perry? I'm logging all the book titles I can see. It's going to take a while. Right. My fault. Just note down your general observations in as much detail as you think necessary. For example, library empty. But we're in the library... Yes, of course. Quite right. But you don't need to include yourself in your notes because you'll be both in and out of every area you search, won't you? Well, like Schrodinger and his new cat experiment. I was about to ask what Schrodinger had done to his cat, but worried it might be something horrible. Then again, I suppose it might be something nice. I decided if I didn't ask, the cat would exist in a state of horrible and nice things happening all at the same time. Anyway, we needed to crack on. I headed out of the library and made my way outside via the main entrance, and Perry, at my instructions, started checking each of the rooms. I walked down the long drive leading to the hall and looked back at the scene from a distance. Through the grand windows you could see people dashing from room to room, but outside all was pretty still. I had a good view of the surrounding grounds and couldn't see anyone making a getaway, meaning the killer was still here. Hang on. What was that? I saw a flash of red between the eastern border and the side of the house. I'm pretty fast on my feet. The trousers help. And by taking a wide angle, I can see around the corner in no time. The Countess and her footman were jogging across the lawn towards Longmeadow Hall. I caught up with them easily. The tight breeches of Charles, the Countess's footman, hindered him almost as much as her richly embroidered gown. Oh, Miss Pink! Hello! <sighs> hello again, Countess. Are you OK? No! I'm most certainly not. I'm all a flutter. Look at the state of it. I don't know if it'll ever recover. She gestured to her face, which was slightly red from the exercise, but nothing that wouldn't soon fade. Sorry, Mum. What might not recover? Was she talking about Lance? Bit late for him. I'm talking about my aura, dear. My aura. Look at it. Just look at it. Very disturbed. Horrible dark swirls. Oh, I see. I didn't see. Yes, it's awful. Must be the shock. So you know. I do. Thomas, the Earl's valet, announced it to everyone. Thomas? How would he know? Charles, have you spoken to him somehow? You two are close, aren't you? Not particularly, ma'am. I've not spoken with him. I've been with you. Well, how would he know about my aura? Maybe he has the gift? No, no. I would have sensed it. Countess de Bruley, I think you need to know something awful. Before I could continue, she snapped into the pose which I now understand to be her receiving mode for mystic messages. Something awful has happened here. I can sense it. That sense is called hearing. I just told her. But there's no point in insulting people if you don't have to. So I played along. That is extraordinary. Yes, something awful has happened here. Lance Brown, the gardener. Horrible, horrible man. Is dead. Poor, poor man. Do you know, now I think about it, I did get a sense of something being a little off with him. Perhaps if I said something, he he could have got the medical attention he needed. Oh, I, I, I'm not sure that would have helped, ma'am. He was murdered. Murdered? Oh, my heavens. Murdered? How? No, no, don't tell me. Oh, I feel faint. Charles, convey me to the parlour and get me a stiff drink. Don't be bullied by Webster, either. The Countess staggered to the house, supported by Charles. But I couldn't move. I was furious with myself. Such a basic error, Penny. It's all well and good checking the perimeter and making a list of suspects and potential witnesses, but you need to inspect the crime scene. I didn't know anything about the actual murder. There could have been a signed confession from the killer for all I knew. I didn't know where Lance's body was, but with a bit of detective work I figured it out. He'd been in the garden with me not that long before his death and was going to meet someone, but was still in his muddy work boots, so probably not heading inside the hall, which meant it was likely to be one of the outbuildings. I'd been near the Topiary Pavilions when Thomas delivered the news, so I could discount the orangery and the coal shed on that side of the house and headed to the Westwood Gardens. There was a wooden potting shed, a larger stone shed, the stables with the Earl and Perry's cars parked out front and a summer house. I took a peek in the summer house, which was glazed, and could see nothing, so continued on to the potting shed, where, sure enough, I found Lance's body. 
but the body wasn't alone. There was a figure hunched over him. When I opened the door, the figure leapt up hurriedly. Ah! Ah! He was a well-built man who had to stoop slightly to keep his head from bashing the beams of the shed. He had a wax moustache and his short chestnut hair was similarly coated in something sticky to secure it in a side parting. His shirt sleeves were rolled up, exposing powerful forearms, and the jacket of his grey suit was folded on the workbench to one side. The shed was quite small, and I couldn't see past him to the dead body. If I'm honest, I wasn't sure I definitely wanted to see a body, so wasn't trying that hard. Who are you? Do you work for the Earl? Huh? The Earl of Longmeadow? His eyes had been darting about the shed, but now they settled on me. I suddenly felt the need to explain myself. I work for the Earl. I'm a detective he's hired. He rubbed his chin with his hand and raised an eyebrow. A detective? But, um, you're a lassie. Well spotted. I work with Perry Pink, my husband. Ah, like his assistant, eh? I suppose so. If Mr Brown here has only just died, how come the Earl's already hired a detective then? Is he some kind of psychic? No, that's the Countess. What's that? Nothing. Perry and I were hired to investigate something else. But being detectives, when we heard about Mr Brown, we obviously felt we would offer our services until the police arrived. I was just about to ask again who this man was and what he was doing there when Perry appeared on the scene. Ah, here we go. I think I've got a head count of who was in the house. Oh, who's this? We've not met. I'm Perry Pink. Pleased to meet you. Oh, my God, what's that behind you? Is that... That's... Oh, blimey. Perry had reached a hand towards this mystery man in the potting shed, but as he did so, caught sight of Lance Brown's body and promptly stuck his head outside and vomited. Oh, that's bogging. Keep it away from the scene, eh? Sorry about that. It's perfectly natural for Emesis, following distressing stimulation of the area postrema. The stranger looked shocked. Stimulating your posterior area? Area postrema? It's in the brain. It means if you see something nasty, sometimes you throw up. Yes, an unusual phenomenon. I can stand here feeling perfectly fine, but if I glance down... Oh, blimey, not again. <laughs> right. Perry lingered by the doorway, looking pale. I think I'll just stay out here. So, who's our new friend then, Penny? That's a good question, Perry. Is it? Good. I crossed my arms and gave the stranger my best, the time has come for answers look. The sort of look my headmistress gave me when she heard about my standing up wee crusade. Well, it's a bit unusual to find someone poking around a dead body. We should call the police. I am the police. Are you? Aye. You got here fast. There's been a murder, ma'am. I'm no likely to hang about, am I? That's a good point. Why didn't you say before? I'm a detective too, Mrs Pink. D.I. Rodney Chase. I like to let people talk if they've a mind to. You'd be amazed what you can pick up if you keep your trap shut. I was keen to ken why you were poking around the body because, as you say, it is a bit unusual. He pinched the ends of his moustache between his fingers and stepped to the side, allowing me to see Lance fully for the first time. I'm pleased to report that my gag reflex was stronger than Perry's, and even though this was the first dead body I'd seen, I didn't flinch. The gardener was lying on his front directly in the centre of the wooden floor. His left hand was caught underneath his torso, and his right was stretched out towards the workbench on which Detective Inspector Chase had left his jacket. To be honest, he just looked like a man having a nap, except around his mouth, where a disgusting grey substance was leaking from the corner of his slightly bluing lips. So, Mrs Pink, what is your professional opinion, then? He smiled as he said this, not exactly mocking me, but something not far off. I straightened my gloves, took a breath and applied the lessons I'd learned by reading about other detectives looking over freshly made corpses. Well, from what I can tell, there are no obvious signs of a struggle. The floor is covered in dirt and a fight would have left marks. The victim has no sign of trauma to his head and there is no blood, meaning stabbing or shooting is unlikely. My guess, based upon all that and whatever is coming out of his mouth, is that this man has been poisoned. Very impressive. Yes, very impressive indeed, Miss Pink. Penny, Mrs Pink. The inspector gave me another sly look and rubbed his chin. What sort of poison were you thinking, young lady? I don't have the kind of recall some of my fictional detectives do, who would know that sort of thing off the top of their heads. But I'd be more than happy to spend a few hours with some medical textbooks and come up with an answer. However, Perry had spotted something I'd missed and piped up from the doorway. Well, under your jacket on the bench is some rat poison, Inspector. Perhaps it could be that? Hmm. Good spot, Mr Pink. I tell you what, why don't we pool our resources and you two can help me with the investigation? Perry looked uncertainly at me. 
I couldn't tell if his expression was just him fighting off nausea or if he wasn't sure what to say. I answered for him. We'd love to. Grant. Now, there are going to be things I'll not be able to share, and obviously it'll not be appropriate for a woman to be involved with certain elements, but I'm sure we can find things for you to do, eh, Hen? I gritted my teeth with a smile. If this meant being part of an official murder investigation, I could put up with this patronising pig. I just want to make it clear he was acting like a pig. I've got a huge respect for the police. Come to think of it, I've got more respect for pigs than I do sexists, but there you go. So then, Perry, why don't you start the sharing with this headcount of yours? Important to know who's in the house, given that one of them is most likely a murderer? Blimey, yes. Do you, uh, I think perhaps we could move the conversation to, um... The effect of poor Mr Brown had left poor Mr Pink looking a bit Mr Green by now. Yes, let's step outside and close the door, shall we? Getting here too, is it, wee lady? I ground my teeth again. If I was going to have to spend much time with this irritating inspector, I would need to increase the calcium in my diet or my teeth would grind to a dust. But I kept my calm and we all stepped outside so Perry could tell us who he'd seen and where. OK, so I left the library with Penny and I began checking the rooms and she headed outside. Aye, that was for the best. Safer for her. There goes another layer of enamel. The first person I ran into was the butler, who shouted at me to stop running. So I did. He didn't seem particularly sad or shocked by the news. Well, then he shouted at me for standing still, cluttering up his hallway, so I ran on. The first room I went into, the parlour, had a French chap in it, comforting a young woman. That'll be Christophe de Brulee and Lady Harriet, I chipped in. Lady Harriet was alone with Christophe de Brulee? Um, actually, Penny, it wasn't Miss Longmeadow. It was definitely the de Brulee boy, but the girl turned out to be the maid. Maisie's her name. I took it down in my notebook, like you said... She was ever so upset, but Christoph seemed to have it all under control, and I was mindful that speed is of the essence, just like when you're experimenting... Perry! With... Quite right. From the parlour, I went across the corridor and found the card room, which was empty. Empty? You're sure? Well, there was the furniture, etc., but Penny told me not to note that stuff down, so I didn't. From there, I went to the large lounge and saw his lordship, the Earl, who was being tended to by the younger Webster. Thomas! That's the one. Lady Harriet and the housekeeper, Mrs Webster, were in the day room that looks out over the terrace. Mrs Webster was giving Lady Harriet sherry. She looked quite shaken. Lady Harriet, not Mrs Webster. Well, actually, both of them, thinking about it. I see. And upstairs? Empty, as far as I could tell. I'll be honest, I only poked my head around the doors and felt pretty sheepish doing that. They're bedrooms, after all, so I suppose someone could have been hiding in a wardrobe. Or behind a curtain like Polonius in the fabulous Hamlet! The inspector's eyes glistened so wildly as he remembered the Danish prince. Perry was ruffled. Yes, I suppose so. Sorry if I should have looked closer, Penny girl. You did brilliantly, Perry. Aye, lad, that's no bad at all. Seven suspects in total, then. Nine. You're quite right, I was being polite. I will have to consider you two as suspects until proven otherwise, I'm afraid. Of course. In that case, it's eleven. Eleven? How'd you make it there? I saw Countess de Brulee and her footman, Charles, in the garden not long after Thomas announced the gardener's death. Did you know? In the garden? I relayed my information and the policeman greeted the news with deep thought. His hands instinctively went to his moustache again. Then he clapped once and said he wanted to address the assembled group and asked Perry and I to help him gather everyone together in the drawing room. I was told to collect Lady Harriet from the day room while Perry gathered the rest. Inspector Chase said he wanted to have another look around the gardens. I don't know what he thought he was going to see. The light was fading quickly, but I wasn't going to question his methods. Not out loud, at least. I found the Earl had joined his daughter, and I asked them to gather in the drawing room. Sorry, who are you giving me instructions in my own house? She's, um, working on the case, dear. The police are here already. But you're a woman, aren't you? You're with the police? I am a woman. But I'm not with the police, or I wasn't. I I am now, in a way. What are you babbling about? Lady Harriet was looking at me like I was something disagreeable on her beautiful shoe, but I stood my ground. My name is Penny Pink, and I work for the P. Pink Detective Agency, and we're assisting the police on this matter. So you're not the police? Not technically, no. Thank heavens for that. Perhaps you can call them. Oh, they're already here, ma'am. I'm helping to gather everyone who was on the grounds at the time of Lance Brown's death. Her ladyship seemed taken back by the speed of the police's arrival. I can't say I blame her, it was pretty fast. I guess the aristocracy don't just get better clothes, but better police protection too. 
The police are here already and gathering everyone who was on the grounds this afternoon. Everyone? Yes, your ladyship, if you wouldn't mind. They're going to find out who has been killing my roses. Daddy, nobody cares about your stinking roses, least of all the police, when there's been a murder. It's probably all connected, my dear. All connected. How? How what? How are your roses connected? By their stems, my dear. What do their stems have to do with murder? How would I know? You just said they were connected. They are connected. Well, the ramblers are, certainly. You have to watch out for the thorns, though. I was forever telling Mark to be careful, but he wouldn't listen. Always pruning without gloves. Lady Harriet looked ready to explode, but I thought I'd heard a potential clue. Sorry to interrupt, sir, but who is Mark? Mark Mims? He was the gardener here, before Lance turned up with his awards and everything. Mark used the right amount of mulch. I don't think Lance uses enough mulch. He says we don't need much mulch. He's got chemical feeds. I've half a mind to feed him his own bloody chemicals for the amount we're paying him. Daddy! What? Lance is dead! Is he? Well, then he got what was coming to him. Don't listen to him, Mrs Pink. He doesn't know what he's saying. She grabbed her father and dragged him to the door. I became aware I wasn't alone in the room. Maisie, the maid, was also there. I looked at her properly for the first time. It's amazing to see how quickly you fall into the rules of a house such as this. In any room, your focus goes instantly to the people dressed in the finery. The uniforms of the staff create a sort of invisibility cloak over them until they speak. Now I took her in, I could see the young girl was terribly upset. M -m -m Mrs Pink, can I talk to you a um, moment? Of course you can, and call me Penny. Thank you, Penny. I'm Maisie. What's the matter, Maisie? Were that true? About the police being here and wanting to talk to everyone about what's happened to Lance? Yes, of course it was. Were you too close? Me and Lance? No chance. He was a grubby, horrible man with his nose in everyone's business, using people to get his own way. I'm happy he's dead, truth be told, but... but... I'm afeard. Afeard? Who says afeard? I didn't have time to worry about it and carried on questioning Maisie. What are you afeard... afraid of? Well, everyone does know how I feel about him after what he did to my brother, Mark, so they'll probably say I killed him. I killed him in my head many a time, but I would never have done it in real life. What did Lance do to your brother, Maisie? Mark was gardener here before Lawrence turned up with a load of fancy awards and that for his gardening. Our Mark won awards too, but only for his lordship's roses, which should have been enough, and the Earl agreed at first. But then Lawrence starts in on him, telling him lies and stories about Mark, saying he's seen him looking dirty at Lady Harrier, and then he shows his lordship a poem apparently Mark had writ. It weren't... Maisie produced a crumpled bit of paper from her apron and began to read. Oh, Harriet, oh, Harriet, I love you. You have blossomed like a flower into the spring of youth. I think of nothing but tasting the sweet fruit you bear, your lovely plums and apple cheeks, your soft peach skin and tasty berries. I'm hungry for you, Mark. Now, three things. One, Mark is clever enough that if he wrote something like that, he wouldn't put his name on it. Two, he's also clever enough to know that if you're writing a poem, it should rhyme. Otherwise, it's not poetry, is it? And three, well, he can't write. Why didn't he tell the Earl that? He did, but the Earl didn't care. By this point, he'd lost one of his favourite roses. Mark didn't know what happened, but that was the final nail in his coffin. He was sacked on the spot and Lance moved into Mark's room next to mine. I hate him, Mrs Pink. Penny, I did hate him, but I didn't kill him. Please believe me. I do, Maisie. Don't worry. I'm sure we'll find the real killer soon enough. Did you say Lance's room is next to yours in the servants' quarters? Yeah, it's two doors down from yours and Mr Pink's, miss. Thank you, Maisie. Now let's hurry to the drawing room. We don't want to keep Inspector Chase waiting. I took Maisie to the drawing room and told Inspector Chase I was feeling queasy after seeing Lance's body. Ah, the delayed effects of the stimulation of your area postrema. Explained Perry needlessly. Of course, Chase immediately accepted I didn't have the stomach for death and told me to go and lie down and let the men handle things. I did not go lie down. I went to look at Lance's bedroom, wanting to scoop up any clues before the inspector could. The first thing I noticed were the empty bottles of wine strewn under the bed. Lance was helping himself to the good stuff from the Earl's cellars. 
There was a small desk with papers scattered across it. It was pages of poetry dedicated to Harriet Longmeadow, so Maisie was right. But from the looks of it, Lance hadn't stopped once he got rid of Mark. Maybe he was in love with Harriet. He was certainly overusing the agricultural imagery. Far too much ploughing of virgin soil. I opened the drawers and found an engraved pocket watch. The Earl of Longmeadow presents this gift to his loyal servant, Seaboom Webster, to be handed down to his son and his son's son and his son's son's son and his son's 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 son and so on. 1753. What was a nearly 200-year-old Webster heirloom doing in Lance Brown's bedroom? I slipped it into my pocket and carried on looking. Aha! What's this? Perhaps this deck of marked cards in the same drawer has something to do with it. Lance was either a trainee magician or more likely cheating at cards. Hmm. Can Penny solve the case before Chase? And can you solve it before her? Let us know on social media at New Old Friends who your top suspect is at the halfway point. Oh, is it half time? Do we have sliced oranges? No, Ferg, we're a theatre company. It's an interval, so we've got a warm glass of white wine. I miss the theatre. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, see you next week. Boy, boy. Crimes of a Country Garden is part of Comedy Who Done It's For Your Ears, a New Old Friends production. Performed by Heather Westwell and Fergus Woods Dunlop, who also writes the show with music and sound from Fred Riding.